Hi everyone. Uh, now it's time to listen to the pathologist on the role of electron microscopy in kidney biopsies. Briefly, my affiliations. I am a consultant and director of Urologics Limited, based in London. I'm also a consultant histopathologist for Express Mint Laboratories in Bahrain. Uh, I report the renal biopsies. And used to be a consultant at uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London and a clinical senior lecturer at King's College Medical School in London. A brief disclosure, most of the material in my presentation today is from my forthcoming ebook, uh, Kidney Biopsy Pathology, a manual. A quick look at short forms or abbreviations used in my presentation though most of them are well-known. I'll just quickly recap them. EM stands for electron microscopy or electron microscopic. GBM, glomerular basement membrane. IF is immunofluorescence microscopy and LM is light microscopy. Let us uh, look at the whole kidney biopsy diagnostic process. <clears throat> the biopsy is taken and we have to reach a morphological diagnosis at this stage. The biopsy is sent to the lab. It is processed to light microscopy and immunofluorescence microscopy. Uh, some labs will do instead of immunofluorescence, uh, immunoperoxidase. After examining these uh, slides, the pathologist may be able to make a diagnosis. So EM is not required. In many cases, diagnosis is possible at this stage. In other cases, often with the uh, mutual consultation between the nephrologist and the pathologist, a decision is taken to undertake electron microscopy. Uh, in some cases, is considered essential. In other cases, it may add into uh, the diagnosis line for the information. And after electron microscopy, it may be possible to render a diagnosis. Electron microscopy may result in further questions that may be asked and further investigations may be necessary as a result of electron microscopy. Uh, they may be serological, genetics, biochemistry, molecular biology, or simply more history. And after uh, obtaining this, these informations, uh, it may be possible to render a final morphological diagnosis or a differential diagnosis. The diagnosis should describe the state of the renal tissue. It should also explain the pathological process behind it and it should inform the nephrologist about the prognosis of the case and also uh, the best possible management uh, of the case and should explain the clinical situation fully so that is an ideal morphological diagnosis this slide explains the utility or usefulness of uh, EM in kidney biopsy diagnostic process. Um, please note that uh, these figures I have obtained uh, on averaging of the uh, figures published in literature. So if you look at the paper, a single paper will give different figures, but I have sort of tried to mean out, take the average of these figures. Uh, in pediatric cases, uh, EM is deemed essential for diagnosis in nearly two thirds of the cases, and it confirms or adds to diagnosis in uh, about quarter of cases. In adults biopsies, the situation is more or less reversed. It is essential for diagnosis in about one third of cases, and it confirms or adds to diagnosis in about two thirds of cases. What is important to realize is that uh, utility of EM or usefulness of EM cannot be predicted for an individual case. So the best process, uh, policy, therefore, is 
for a nephrologist to take a sample for EM in all cases and reserve it and it can be then processed if required at a later date. The role of uh, electron microscopy in congenital kidney diseases, uh, as you have noticed before, that it is considered uh, essential in most cases. It is a key investigation in non-syndromic cases. What do I mean by that? Uh, take nail patella syndrome, uh, classic syndrome uh, consists of uh, abnormal dystrophic nails, abnormal patella bone or absent patella bone, and uh, ileal bone abnormalities. Uh, but some cases may not have these somatic manifestations. The only uh, finding would be uh, abnormal glomerular basement membrane with collagen fibers. So these are non-syndromic cases in which the EM may provide the first indication of existence of the syndrome. So it becomes key investigation. Similar uh, uh, situation exists in, uh, say, Fabry's disease, uh, which is maybe uh, in females, it is heterozygous. And then um, in these heterozygous females, the EM with classic in, uh, inclusions uh, may be the first indication of presence of the disease. And the Fabry's disease in females may and not be, uh, may not be associated with uh, significant cardiovascular abnormalities, or maybe uh, the CVS abnormalities may occur very late in life, but presence of inclusions indicates the presence of the disease. Further investigation then then called for, and then the, uh, the whole uh, family may be investigated. Uh, and also an important, point about it is that electron microscopy decides which further genetic or other investigations required. Uh, for example, take FSGS, about 11% of FSGS cases uh, uh, have a genetic mutation behind them. However, there are 109 genes uh, which uh, are responsible for uh, FSGS uh, uh, mutation of these genes. And therefore, the electron microscopy will then indicate which of these 109 genes should be investigated. So it sort of narrows the field, makes it more practical. Uh, this slide sh uh, shows you uh, an important feature of the electron microscopy of the glomerulus. A glomerular capillary loop is illustrated here. Um, that is the capillary lumen with an RBC in it. And then here is the important globular basement membrane. It is trilaminar. It has three layers. Innermost layer is constituted by the endothelium. Then is the lamina densa, so-called because of electron density. It is composed of type four collagen and the outer layer consists of these food processes. These food processes belong to a cell called podocyte and are distinct, and they are connected to each other by slit membranes. The flow of the uh, filtrate is from plasma across the GBM into the urinary space, and towards the mesangium lies the mesangium cells. I shall now illustrate a uh, few examples of congenital kidney diseases where electron microscopy is key or essential for diagnosis. The first example I've selected is of thin membrane disease. It's in not a very rare condition. It presents with um, Persistent hematuria, often from early age, kidney function remains normal. There is often family history, and the GBM is diffusely thinned, uh, and it can it should be measured uh, by taking random measurements, um, and these are the normal values for adult males and females, and in children up 
about an age of, of 11 years, the adult value should be reached. This GBM thickness measurement can only be done, of course, by electron microscopy. In all cases of uh, thin membrane disease, Alpha genetics are recommended, and I shall explain why in the next slide. A syndrome related to thin membrane disease is Alport syndrome. Uh, in this syndrome, there are mutations in uh, alpha-3, alpha-4, alpha-5 chains of type 4 collagen. This type of uh, collagen alpha chains are responsible uh, for formation of a healthy lamina densa. Uh, here is an illustration of a normal capillary loop. Notice the uh, intensely electron dense single layer of uh, lamina densa here, which is absent in the patient's electron microscope uh, image. Instead of a single layer of electron dense uh, lamina densa, you have lamination and splits of many thinner layers, which anastomose and merge with each other to produce this uh, basket view appearance and some granulation. And also notice the convex surface of the GBM is scalloped. Um, the condition is underdiagnosed, especially in females. Many cases of thin membrane disease will have similar mutations. Therefore, all cases of thin membrane disease should be investigated for uh, relevant mutations and noted here. A rather rare condition is nail patella syndrome, uh, which manifests as uh, various uh, nail and bony abnormalities, and uh, the renal uh, problems may arise very late in life. The kidney biopsy on electron microscopy shows a grossly thickened basement membrane, GBM, and this thickened GBM has areas of clearing, so-called lacunae, and deposition of collagen fibers. Now, if the patient does not have extra renal manifestation, then the electron microscopy of the kidney may provide the first or initial diagnostic features and then trigger off the investigation, the genetic investigation, and so on. So the diagnosis may be made by electron microscopy of the kidney biopsy. So it becomes essential for diagnosis. In Fabry's disease, another uncommon condition, there is a deficiency of alpha-galactosidase A enzyme that produces accumulation of glycosphingolipid uh, in inclusions, which are known as zebra bodies. Uh, one such in, uh, condition, uh, and one such uh, collection of uh, inclusions is seen in protocyte here, and the gene responsible is galactosidase alpha gene. In females, uh, the condition may be heterozygous, usually is heterozygous, and there may be uh, no cardiovascular abnormalities, and therefore electron microscopy may provide the initial diagnostic clue, uh, which may trigger off various investigations and, of course, the investigation of the whole family for the disease. In many acquired kidney diseases, uh, uh, EM may be a key or essential investigation. As the first example of acquired diseases where EM is essential uh, for diagnosis, I will start with minimal chain disease. Uh, in this condition, the light microscopy and immunofluorescence microscopy of the kidney biopsy may show no lesion. That's why the name is minimal chain disease or normal or light microscopy. Whereas the EM provides the only clue to the diagnosis by showing the diffuse effacement of uh, uh, food processes of podocytes. Uh, here is a normal uh, uh, capillary loop showing the distinct preserved food processes which are not seen here because they are effaced. So without EM, diagnosis is not possible. Minimal chain disease may be superimposed on other renal diseases, as we shall see in subsequent slides. And the next example is a fairly common diabetic nephropathy. The diabetic nephropathy is uh, pathologically divided into 
or graded into four classes, classes one to four, and this is known as laden classification. Classes two to four can be diagnosed by light microscopy. However, the earliest involvement, that is class one, uh, is uh, diagnosed by measuring the GBM thickness, which can obviously be done by EM only. So if GBM thickness is over the highest limit for females or males, then that is the class one diabetic nephropathy or diabetic glomeropathy sometimes called and at this stage uh, the uh, proteinuria will not may not be obvious uh, by measuring it with the test strip it will be a microalbuminemia stage proteinuria so em is essential for diagnosing class one of diabetic nephropathy dense deposit disease falls within the spectrum of C3 glomeropathy, uh, but these conditions are associated with the uh, abnormal regulation of the complement uh, pathways, <coughs> uh, alternate complement pathways, and uh, that results in deposition of uh, membrane attack complex C5 to 9 within the lamina densa. Uh, you see here, this is the material, the MAC complex, which is deposited here. In the lamina densa and it abruptly ends and it then lamina densa normally normal lamina densa continues so this uh, so-called uh, banana shape or sausage shape deposition is characteristic of the condition and there may be also uh, deposits of similar material within the uh, mesangium uh, so this disease can be diagnosed only by electron microscopy. It can be suspected by light microscopy, but definitive diagnosis requires electron microscopy for diagnosis. Monoclonal gammopathy may occur in two forms. Uh, there may be no organ involvement, and in that case, kidney biopsy by light immunofluorescence and EM is free of lesions, is negative, and that is known as monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Whereas if renal involvement occurs in a case of monoclonal gammopathy, then uh, light and immunofluorescent microscopy may provide a diagnosis, but electron microscopy actually defines the lesion, what type of lesion is present. One fairly frequent uh, example of MGRS is amyloid, uh, the light chain amyloid, I mean. And then in this condition, uh, there is a deposition of congruent positive material, easily diagnosable by light microscopy. However, early amyloid detection of early amyloid is problematic. Now, this is a case here where uh, uh, I'm showing you um, Congo red stain where really very small amounts of mesangial congruent positivity is seen and some interstitial positivity here. We were not sure whether this is in fact amyloid. Whereas on electron microscopy, there is no problem. There is deposition of this material within the uh, capillary walls, this way here and here, and on higher magnification, uh, one can easily see these randomly distributed unbranched fibrils, eight to nine, eight to twelve nanometers in size. Um, so diagnosis is fairly easy on EM. Fibrillary glomerulopathy or fibrillary glomerulonephritis uh, is a condition which is fairly uncommon, but it results in deposition of similar fibril, similar to amyloid, but they are thicker, about 12 to 24 nanometers in size. And uh, the electron microscopy then triggers the diagnostic process and more recently available uh, immunoperoxidase immun stain for heat shock protein called DNA JB9 uh, clinches the diagnosis. So the condition is diagnosed um, based on presence of fibrils as well as the positivity for this stain.
light chain deposition disease is another example of MGRS, where usually kappa light chain, uh, monoclonal kappa light chain, or sometimes less commonly lambda light chain, uh, depo is deposited in various glomerular compartments in the mesangium as well as as in the subendothelial layer uh, in the form of a powdery granular material. And just to emphasize that the electron microscopy of the kidney biopsy is not limited only to the glomerular abnormalities, but in this condition, there is there are deposits of similar material in tubular basement membrane as well. In some of the cases of monoclonal light chains, one finds the deposition of the light chain, again, more commonly kappa than lambda. So deposition occurs in the cytoplasm of uh, proximal tubules. If the deposition is in a crystalline format, then it's known as light chain proximal tubulopathy with crystal, or it can occur without crystal formation. A proportion of these cases will develop acquired Fanconi syndrome because of tubular dysfunction. Now, there are instances where electron microscopy adds to the diagnosis. It's not essential, but it adds to it. Another example of an acquired kidney disease where uh, EM is helpful uh, is uh, membranous glomerulopathy, which is divided into primary and secondary types. Uh, it's possible by immunofluorescence to distinguish between these two types, but EM may help. For example, uh, you, you may see uh, typical subepithelial deposits that occurs in both the types, primary and secondary membranes. But if you find substantial mesangial deposits, then it's more likely to be secondary type of membranous glomerulopathy. In acute post-infectious, often post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, uh, diagnosis is possible uh, based on the clinical history, serology, and uh, light and immunofluorescence microscopy. But EM really confirms the diagnosis by demonstrating this subepithelial humps. Another example of uh, EM being useful uh, or adding to the diagnostic line is uh, uh, lupus nephritis. In proliferative lupus nephritis, the expected deposits are subendothelial, and uh, mesangial. But if you find in addition subepithelial deposits, then that raises the question of uh, or the possibility of an additional class five. So proliferative lupus nephritis on its own is either class three or class four, but uh, often by light microscopy, it is difficult to be sure uh, of the presence of a membranous component and therefore EM here helps by demonstrating subepithelial deposits, therefore uh, adding on to the class phi to the diagnosis as well. As an example of an, another acquired kidney disease where EM is useful, uh, I will offer you the scenario of a 24-year-old female suspected thin membrane disease because of family history and history of persistent pathology. Uh, uh, immaturia from a, uh, from childhood with normal kidney function. She develops uh, proteinuria suddenly uh, of seven grams and uh, kidney biopsy shows, in fact, in fact confirms the uh, thin membrane, but also shows the diffuse effacement of food processes that would explain the onset of proteinuria. So in other words, she has minimal chain disease superimposed on thin membrane disease. Now, this diagnosis was not possible without electron microscopy. So EM can add to diff, uh, light and immunofluorescence microscopy by identifying podocyte foot process effacement um, as an additional pathology 
uh, not only in thin membrane disease, but in lupus nephritis, IgA nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy, and many other situations. Uh, now we come to the uh, use of electron microscopy for biopsies on kidney allografts. Now, traditionally, the electron microscopy was performed uh, to detect recurrence of native disease in the transplant, uh, especially, for example, in a known case of FSGS, uh, soon after transplant was put in, within 48 hours, uh, sudden onset of proteinuria occurs. A light microscopy and IF shows no lesion, whereas EM shows uh, diffuse effacement of food processes. So that is a sign of early recurrence of FSGS. So that was the main use. But during the last 10 years or so, it has realized that uh, you can make an early diagnosis of chronic antibody-mediated rejection. Uh, so that electron microscopic lesions are now included in BAMF grading of these biopsies. The current BAMF recommendations are for electron microscopy in all cases of presensitized uh, allografts, DSA positive cases, cases where C4D positivity of peritubular capillaries is seen, cases where light microscopy shows GBM duplication, or there's a history of biopsy pro on antibody mediated rejection where electron microscopy was not performed in an earlier biopsy. Just to give an example of uh, uh, this condition and the use of EM, uh, this is a biopsy which shows uh, on light microscopy silver stain uh, definite glomerulitis, but the GBM is monolayered and thin, normal, whereas EM shows uh, diffuse expansion of the subendothelial space with rarefaction, which is filled of fluff material, and there is deposition of new. Uh, lamina densa. So obviously, it is a case of chronic antibody mediated rejection in its early stage. Now, early diagnosis is important for this condition because once it is established, it's very difficult to then treat it and often will progress to long term graft loss. Another feature of chronic antibody mediated rejection is uh, in the peritubular capillaries. You see the uh, endothelial layer is not conspicuous and the basal lamina of these capillaries is single layered. Whereas in chronic antibody media rejection, the endothelium is prominent with thick and there is multi-layering of the basal lamina of these capillaries. In this particular case, at least seven layers are seen. I've been trying to sell you the use of electron microscope or kidney biopsies. I think now is the time to look at the problems. The first problem with the use of electron microscope is the high cost of the instruments and their maintenance. And the solution is to use cheaper, easy to maintain benchtop electron microscopes. The second main problem is shortage of trained technical staff who can process these samples and the solution is that they should be trained at accredited programs. So there are no shortcuts here. They should be properly trained. And the third main problem is pathologists who can really interpret kidney biopsies with electron microscopy are not available locally, not available everywhere. And the solution is that you adopt a program of remote online reporting. So the solution is to set up EM hubs, which have cheaper instruments, who have well-trained technical staff who can produce high quality images. And pathologists, if not available locally, they can look at images remotely and report them. So the solution therefore is networking. A few brief uh, suggestions for sampling of 
for electron microscopy for nephrologists. You should ideally take a sample of 4EM in a proper fixative in all cases. They can then be processed if necessary. Secondly, the samples reprocessed from wax or IF are not optimal for electron microscopy. They are not really the good ones. You can't, you can't do full analysis, full assessment of these samples. Also, you should make sure that cortex with glomeruli is included, although some of the condition can be diagnosed by tubular morphology, but most of the diagnosis are rendered on glomerular abnormalities. And also, you should make sure the sample is fully submerged in the fixative. So finally, what are my take-home messages for you? Firstly, the EM is essential or as diagnosis for most kidney biopsies. Secondly, EM is not satisfactory on tissue reprocess from wax or IF sample. Therefore, the best policy is to take a sample for EM in all cases to be processed later if necessary. EM often suggests other investigations for genetics and biochemistry, etc. And finally, you should try to establish EM hubs with networking. That is the most practical solution. These are the list of my references, which may be available in printed form later on for you. And lastly, a big thank you from me for listening to my talk.